dawn doesn't break in Athens the way it does in some cities. It's eerily quiet here, even at 7.30 a.m., when many American cities are already bustling with activity. But as the sun starts to rise and a pink hue creeps into the lavender sky, the five million residents of Athens ease ever so slowly into their day. After all, it's a late night kind of place with 10 p.m. dinner and drinks and conversation into the early morning hours. However, the sunrise isn't so bad when your eyes open to see what others have seen for centuries. A spectacular view as the morning light envelops the Acropolis, the ancient fortress built upon the rocks above the city. A short time later, just to the west, on the limestone rocks surrounding the ruins, a group of Americans, undeterred by the light drizzle that has now crept in, listen to Peter Schultz, right, so a Pied Piper of sorts, under a black umbrella. A man they've followed 5,000 miles across the ocean for a shot at immersing themselves, even for just a short time, in a new way of life, in a very old land. Schultz knows how to spin a tale as he prepares them for a day of walking through the Acropolis, including the Parthenon, the most revered of all ancient temples. You are amongst ancient people and ancient things. These things have not changed in millennia. And all of the hustle and bustle and all the nonsense that we think is important, we begin to realize, you know what? Maybe not so much. It's very hard to get worked up about your email, about your boss's stress, or about corporate action when you are watching the most beautiful sunset in the world, eating the best fish dinner of your life. You have to go out of your way to, to, to worry about those sort of everyday things when you're in a place that drips with authenticity and truthfulness. He shares all the facts they need to know, like the teacher he is. But he's also that cool professor who peppers his anecdotes of Greek gods, goddesses, and historic battles with words like bro, dude, and epic. With Schultz's narration, Ancient Greece comes alive like a hot new Netflix series. For the last 10 years, the charismatic Schultz, an archaeologist and entrepreneur, has taken a group of mostly Midwesterners to Greece, the country he calls the center of my world. But it's not simply a vacation to learn about the country, credited with giving us democracy, literature, religion, and the arts. It's much more than that. As Schultz would say, it's mind-blowing when you can witness the world shrink before your eyes. To see that our big, wide world isn't that big or wide after all. We invite you along for this journey to see how bridges are being built from the Midwest to the Mediterranean. And it all began with a simple bottle of olive oil. Schultz's love affair with Greece started in 1997 when he was a graduate student working on his dissertation in Athens. His project was set just yards from where the group now sits, within the walls of the Acropolis, where he worked on the art and restoration architecture of a small temple. Like a lot of grad students seeking to please their advisor, Peter couldn't say no when she asked if he'd be willing to help her husband, Eugene, put labels on bottles of olive oil he was producing on their land two and a half hours south of Athens in Mistra. I didn't know what that entailed at this point. But I went over to his warehouse and he was there with crates of olive oil and we sat there sort of in this barn sticking on the very first labels of bottles of his olive oil, Mistra Estates, extra virgin olive oil.
And here we are. As the popularity of the oil grew, some of Schultz's customers started to wonder why Eugene's oil was so good. Schultz would explain that it comes direct from Eugene's small farm, from olive trees that have been around for centuries. It's natural and unprocessed, and each year tastes just a little bit different based upon the weather and other environmental factors. But better than explain it all, Schultz started to put together a pilgrimage of sorts. Every October, he began to take about 10 people with him to walk the city streets and cobblestone paths of Athens, Sparta, Mistra, and more to learn where and how the oil they were buying was made and to show off the place he calls a second home. The Greeks are passionate and patriotic and truthful and proud. They are standing at the end of a tradition that encompasses all of our most profound moments as a civilization. I mean, if you think about the origins of philosophy and comedy and democracy and theater and art that is rooted in Greece, the New Testament, it's written in Greek, you know, it was a big deal. They did this because everybody read it. So really, in many ways, Greece is the foundation and the fountainhead of who we are as a people. It's one of those mornings in Greece that has some tourists asking, do I bring my umbrella or not? The rain that spit on them as they sip their morning espresso has now subsided. Ominous, almost angry clouds giving way to a glorious blue sky. It's as if Zeus, the Greek god of thunder and lightning himself, decided to give them a break just as they climb the stairs of his mythical home, the Athenian Acropolis. Several of the Greek gods and goddesses are honored here on these limestone hills. The goddess Athena gets top billing. After all, the city of Athens is named for her, and the most famous structure within the Acropolis, the Parthenon, dedicated to her. Over the centuries, the Parthenon, and in fact all of the monuments that make up the Acropolis, endured war, weather, natural disasters, and vandalism to be remembered for many things as a home to kings, a citadel, a mythical home of the gods, a religious center, a tourist attraction, and an enduring symbol of democracy and Western civilization itself. But if the Acropolis is the heart of this nation, what is its lifeblood? I'm sitting just west of the Acropolis in Athens, where something really interesting happened in 480 BC. They discovered a vein of silver here, a mine that they considered a blessing. It brought them riches for centuries. Well, flash forward about 2,500 years and go two hours south, and the riches and the blessings are now coming in the form of liquid gold. Liquid gold, olive oil, the lifeblood of Greece. But where do we start mining for this liquid gold? Peter Schultz is the guy to ask. An archaeologist, he studied and lived in Greece for seven years and now leads others in expeditions through the countryside and the olive groves that changed his life. A trip via car from city to country and so much more. When you leave Athens, it's like going back in time. You'll cross the isthmus at Corinth on the way down to Sparta and once you get onto the main toll road and drive, it'll be absolutely empty and you'll drive by ruins from the Romans, from the ancient Greeks, from the Bronze Age, from the medieval period, and you'll wind your way through these lush green valleys, and then finally reach the Valley of Sparta, which again is this like wide basin flanked by olive trees, 360 degrees. It's absolutely gorgeous, mesmerizing. It's all part of the Peloponnese, the southern peninsula of Greece, and for Schultz, the place where he struck gold when he met up and started partnering with an olive oil farmer named Eugene Lithopoulos. Eugene produces the olive oil in his grove, 
while Peter helps bring it back home to friends in the United States. Schultz started calling it liquid gold not just for the smooth, rich taste of the oil, but for the ways in which the oil made him feel. It is a truly ancient primordial history. As a genotype, we are talking about a plant that has lived on Earth for millions of years. In terms of human interaction with the olive oil tree, it goes back, in terms of the archaeological record, at least 10,000 years. There have been digs in Crete, in Italy, in Israel most recently, that shows olive oil resin stored in ceramic that goes back to, you know, 12, thousand BC. Schultz says the oil was used more than just to eat or drink. It became the fundamental staple of religious, political, and cultural life for the ancient Greeks. It was a kind of currency. It was awarded in games as prizes. It was a base for all of their perfumes. It was the medium for their perfumes. It was used by athletes in the gymnasium and during the Olympics. It was offered to the gods. It was the source of profound pride throughout the Mediterranean basins in terms of trade. The olive tree and olive branch became national symbols for Greece, highlighting the Greeks' love of peace and hospitality. But many of the biggest trees come from the region of Mistra and Sparta. Schultz says some of the oldest olive trees can be as much as 30 feet across, sprawling, strange, gargantuan trees. They are truly primordial when they're ancient. I mean, they look like strange, hunched grandfather, you know, that you've ever seen. He's been around in that field for 6,000 years. He's still giving us the fruit every winter. You know, it's just incredible. The influence of olive oil on Western civilization crossed oceans, even to colonial America. Founding father Thomas Jefferson, often called the first foodie president, was a huge fan of olive oil after being introduced to it while living in France in the 1780s. He even called olive trees the most interesting plant in existence. And he worked hard to bring olive oil farming to his young country. He convinced South Carolina to let him purchase young olive trees, then spent years promoting their cultivation. He believed that among the blessings which this tree sheds on the poor was its ability to make a limited diet more wholesome and vegetables drizzled with olive oil more appealing. Sounds like something we'd hear today. But unfortunately, by 1804, Jefferson had to admit failure after South Carolina's farmers were less than enthusiastic about the project. Not only were they impatient that olive trees took years to produce their first crop, but they fell victim to bouts of bad weather, random frost, and humidity. Disappointed by the Carolina olive oil project, but still wanting the oil for himself, Jefferson resorted to importing four to five gallons a year from France until his death. Jefferson's dream of American olive oil didn't perish. Olive trees are currently grown in a handful of American states, including California, Oregon, and Texas. Fortunately, the Greeks were more patient than we were. They were willing to put in the years and effort of cultivating the trees. Perhaps they felt like they didn't have a choice. Remember the Greek goddess Athena, the one honored with the construction of the Parthenon? It turns out she's also the goddess responsible for bringing the olive tree here to her people, where it provided food, light, heat, medicine, perfume, and shelter from the sun. She is even said to have planted the original olive tree at the Acropolis. Take the story for what it is, Greek mythology. But Schultz says there's something very deep and spiritual about the ancient folklore surrounding liquid gold and how it connects to us today. For the ancient Athenians, the olive tree was a gift from Athena. So when they build buildings like the Parthenon and they honor her, and part of that is a kind of uh, reciprocal gift for the gift that Athena gave when he bestowed the olive tree upon them. Once again, we are part of that same tradition. Some of the trees that are giving us fruit, giving us oil, have been farmed and been 
utilized for that exact same purpose for millennia. It's important to get your head in the right space when you come to Mistra in southern Greece. It's miles away in distance and mindset from the metropolis of Athens, two and a half hours to the north. You'll drive up towards Mistra and above you, you will see Mount Tegetos, which is this beautiful sort of rugged mountain peak with olive trees climbing the sides. Facing you will be the remains of Byzantine castles and churches that was Mistra proper. And there, like a sea of green, will be olive trees as far as you can see all the way down to Sparta. Feels um, like you've stepped into another world. The ruins of a medieval palace and churches are open to anyone who want to navigate the rugged cobblestone paths. The town on the mountain was virtually abandoned by the 19th century when the modern town of Sparta popped up in the valley. The only inhabitants are a handful of nuns who still live at the Pantanasa Monastery, tucked away amid the greenery and stray cats. So maybe you don't need to get your mind in the right space after all. It just kind of happens when you get here. As the Greek City Times wrote, as soon as you arrive here, you sense a strong spiritual energy, which brings peace and calm to the body, mind, and soul. Over the years, I don't own the land. I serve the land. I'm the one of the guys that pass by, and there will be another guy, and another guy. If you respect the environment, you get back. It's very simple.
sometimes one tree will have three or four varieties growing on it. He points out the nuances we might not notice. Look at the small leaves, small fruit. Bigger leaves, bigger fruit. Look at the top. It has olives because it goes like up to get the sun. The top is called eagle. He also shows us how some trees are surrounded by wildflowers, blackberries and oregano. point out there are very good olive oils in America. Sometimes you just need to do your research. Experts say if the oil is too cheap or too light in color, it might not be extra virgin olive oil, despite what it says on the label. Eugene and Peter are doing their part to help some foodies in America know they're getting pure oil by bringing it to them almost straight from the tree. But right now, Eugene, as a small producer, doesn't have the capacity or even the desire to sell to the masses. 
They are now importing oil to North Dakota, Minnesota, and Texas. It's usually available by pre-order months in advance or at one or two specially selected places in each town where it is shipped. We don't want it to be everywhere. We want it to be something that you have to seek. That's, that's the liquid gold ethos, right? Is that this is really good stuff, right? Gold is, has value in part because it's scarce, because it's precious. You have to seek it out. It's like hidden treasure. But for Eugene, the treasure also comes from something else. The relationships and friendships he's making with the Americans who make the pilgrimage to his land every year. That's my pleasure, you see, meeting very interesting, very nice people and sharing something which is given by nature. It's a random Wednesday night in the middle of October. Nothing to celebrate, except maybe if you're Greek. Then you just celebrate that it's a random Wednesday night in the middle of October. Tonight, outside the small town of Mistra in southern Greece, they dine on rich natural foods while listening to friends play their favorite old folk tunes. When one is so inclined, he might even get up to dance. Are we witnessing the secret to living a healthy life? Americans have been looking for the answer to that secret for more than 50 years, as we've become less and less healthy with every passing decade. Consider this. In 1950, about 10% of the population was considered obese. Today, it's grown to about 42%. And with that, a myriad of health problems, like higher chances of heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. Do you ever look at old photos of people in the 1940s or 50s and think, why were they so slender? Well, of course, you can't boil it down to one simple thing. Certainly, we're more sedentary these days, and our portion sizes are larger. We're more stressed out and get less sleep. But come on, these people back then were drinking whole milk, eating bacon, and slurping down full-fat ice cream milkshakes down at the malt shop. Still, they didn't seem to worry much about their fat intake until someone told them they should. And that's when it all started to change. As research has evolved over time, we really realized that that was probably one of the most detrimental public health messages that was shared with people. What it did is it cut fat from the diet and it increased sugar, salt, and processed carbohydrates. And those are the things that are really damaging to our bodies. I'm Megan Myrdal. I'm a registered dietitian and live here in Moorhead. I have been working on local food initiatives in our community for about 10 years. Myrdal is co-founder of Foods of the North, whose mission is to celebrate, connect, and empower our local food community in Fargo, North Dakota, Moorhead, Minnesota, and beyond. She's also the co-author of the book Midwest Mediterranean, which explores the Mediterranean diet and how the diet can be adapted and celebrated in the American heartland. Her co-author is Peter Schultz, who's organized this dinner of friends on the Random Wednesday. It's Myrdal's first trip to Greece. She and the others dine on Greek salad, vegetables, tender potatoes soaked in olive oil, and roasted pork. For dessert, baklava, and the after-dinner drink, sipero, to help digest the delicious meal. A far cry from what most of these Americans, including Schultz, grew up eating for dinner. I grew up eating a very typical kind of an American apple pie kind of diet, right? I mean, steak and potatoes, I like my mac and cheese. I live for a cheeseburger from McDonald's, you know, the, the whole deal. When I moved to Athens, everything shifted. The Greek diet, the Mediterranean diet, is very different, Myrdal says, 
from the standard American diet, ironically or not, called the SAD diet. The main tenets of the Mediterranean diet is it's a very plant-based diet. So it's really rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds. However, being from America's heartland, home to so many cattle ranchers, it's tricky, says Myrdal. I struggle with the red meat thing. We are a ranching and cattle state, and I personally know a lot of cattle ranchers. So to tell people to completely remove red meat from their diet, I would never prescribe that to people. In all honesty, I would say, watch out more for the processed grains and sugar than I would for red meat. I think that that has more significant poor health outcomes for people. But it, it really comes down to, well, first is portion, right? I, I really think that watching our portions of things like that is hugely important. And two, there's a lot of really great opportunities to purchase animals and purchase meat from farmers that are using really amazing practices to handle their animals and then finish the meat before it comes to you. Our farmers and ranchers are, are handling their cattle so that they are grazing on native pasture and native prairie. And there is research that shows that animals that are raised in that way, that feed on that type of pasture land versus being finished with corn and soybeans, that the fat profile is completely different in those cuts of meat and that that meat has a different impact on our body. To kind of lump red meat all together into one umbrella isn't really fair to the meat industry to say that. And when it comes to cutting out some grains, which grow in abundance here, Myrdal says the opportunity is there not to slash them from our diets, but to rethink how we consume traditional Heartland products. And perhaps even open up markets to new products. If you eat the whole wheat and you cook that up on the stove and you enjoy it in a bowl with some vegetables and some nuts and some beans and a drizzle of olive oil, an olive oil-based vinaigrette, you have an entirely different metabolic response in the body to that grain. So it's how you eat it and how it's prepared. And that's one of the things that I think is so exciting about this Midwest Mediterranean concept is we live in the grain belt of America, right? We grow so many grains here. We grow so many beans and legumes. And these are two foods that are hugely important aspects of the Mediterranean diet. So that's one of the emphasis that we have in this book is, is getting folks to, to see those foods and see new and unique ways to enjoy them. However, change is hard. So what's the incentive to start eating like this? Here it all says science. One of the most impactful studies that has been done around the Mediterranean diet and specifically with olive oil is a study called the Predimed study that was out of Spain. It was a huge research intervention trial where they had individuals who were prescribed the Mediterranean diet and there was a certain group that was given a weekly supply of a liter of olive oil that was delivered to their doorstep to encourage its use, to make sure we're not only telling you to eat this way, but we're gonna give you this food so that you have it every single week in your diet. It was supposed to go on for five years. They cut it off at two years because the research was so substantial and so strong that the group that was having that intervention had such a marked decrease in risk of cardiovascular events. That's a study where if you talk to any major cardiologist or heart health professional, that is something that they always reference because it's just one of the most impactful studies around this way of eating. As winter envelops the American Midwest, as you can see your breath through your scarf and hardly feel your fingers through your too thin gloves, it would be easy to feel like we have nothing in common with our fellow humans in the warm Mediterranean 5,000 miles away. After all, as we crunch through the snow, skate on the ice, and ask questions like, can you stay for supper? Or how are the roads coming in? In Greece, the sun still shines. The gentle breeze over the Aegean Sea doesn't even know what wind chill is. And snow boots, well, they'd never be seen on the sandy shores. And the questions they ask? Probably more animated. And over cigarettes and Cipero, an after-dinner drink handed down by 14th century monks. Are we even on the same planet? It might not seem like it, until you go back to nature. And the farm fields where all of us get our food. 
it really comes down to individual people in all parts of the world to make the world seem a little bit smaller. People like Eugene Laropoulos. We talk a lot about farm to table and how important that is. And we see our tables every day, but how often do we see the farm? Now, we don't see the farm here when it's only 20 miles away, but what would it be like to visit your farm when it's 4,000 miles away? And that was the root of this project. Let's take some people who care, who love this stuff, and introduce them to the farmer and his lands. So the basic idea behind the trip is to create more linkage between our two communities, to further cement that bridge between our two towns, cultivate this sense of friendship and interconnectedness that makes this such a fascinating project. So it really came out of the oil. And after a year of Zoom calls and social distancing, connecting one-on-one -on -one in person is pretty powerful. When our producer Eugene offers something to us, I think it's really exciting to have a group of people come along to actually take that gift from him by the hand. We have airplanes, internet, we are more connected as a people and as a species than we've ever been. This is profoundly exciting. But I think it's nice to supplement that kind of hyper interconnectivity with the real intimacy of human connection. So what we're building is a bridge between the Red River Valley and this area of the Peloponnese. At first glance, this is a story about a bridge being built between two cultures, that pipeline between the Midwest and the Mediterranean, where Schultz's acquaintances here are helping support and sustain a farmer in Greece. But Schultz says this shouldn't be viewed as an isolated case, but a movement of using food to bring people, even former enemies, together. We have to cultivate sustainable habits. One of the habits that all of us are involved in three, four, ten times a day is eating. So the moment that fundamental habit, the moment that is harnessed towards regenerative goals, we win. But what it means is you have to give up your old enemies. There's no punching bag anymore. You, you don't have a convenient evil out there, somebody that you can point a finger at. You're like, no, we're all in this together, and guess what? There is tons of room for everybody's potential solutions, but at the end of the day, we all have to eat. And if we're eating in a way that heals the earth, the earth will be healed. Schultz says farmers like Eugene exist all over the world, who take a great deal of ecological pride in their lands, and the consumers of what they produce benefit from it. This project really brings to light is that, yes, we want to enjoy and eat as much local food as we can, but there are things that we cannot grow here. And we are living at this amazing time in human history where we have this global food economy, where we can source things from all over the world that people have never been able to enjoy before. We have an opportunity to be super thoughtful about our purchasing too. And that's what this olive oil represents as a way to have that personal relationship across the world, knowing that you're sustaining an amazing farmer who's doing great work for his local community, bringing something back here that's healthful and nutritious for us, and that we can create great food with the foods that are also grown here and sharing it with people. The closer we can keep our food coming directly from the farm, the better we're all gonna be. This is about sustaining our bodies and our souls and our earth together.
if we're doing our job, hopefully this project and the thousands and thousands of other projects that are just like it will continue to do their work and we'll continue to see the health benefits both ourselves and the earth as the decades roll by. As we continue to move to a more regenerative frame, you're gonna see farmers making way more money. You're gonna see consumers eating way better food. We are gonna see middlemen continually being cut out of the equation, which is only fair. And we are gonna see a healthier population, a healthier planet. It's, it's inevitable, but the only way to address that is by way of agriculture. I mean, food is the energy that runs our civilization. The basis of the civilization is food. It's, it's easy to forget it because we take it for granted. Right, because right now in America, we take our food for granted. Farmers want to make money. Absolutely, all right? People want great food, absolutely. And the future of agriculture in America, in the world is regenerative. That's a fact. And in 30 years, we are going to be going to farms that look like the wilderness. And we are going to be empowered and um, emboldened and energized by their presence and the people who run them are going to be filthy rich and they are going to be making incredible food for the planet. Clearly, Peter Schultz, the entrepreneur, the pied piper of olive oil, who cooked up the idea years ago to take a few Americans to the source of their food, is a talker and an idea man who's energized by what could be. How building relationships like the one he built with Eugene can be replicated many times over by many other people. Connecting small producers worldwide to make local global and global local. In the end, shrinking our world, helping our farmers, saving our planet, and maybe even our own lives. For Eugene, the Greek man with the smiling eyes, even in the pouring rain, he says it's not that grand of a concept. In fact, just comes down to what each and every one of us can do. You know what my mother said? You should not care what the others are doing. What you are doing. You offer something which is extremely good in quality in very affordable price. I have a good olive oil, people can enjoy it.